Welcome back to Understanding VC. I'm your host Rahul. Today we'll delve into quantum computing from the perspective of venture capital with Jan Hauer. Jan is a principal at Apex Ventures where he invests in European early stage deep tech startups in areas of quantum technologies, future computing, space and AI. He has over 12 years of experience at the intersection of technology breakthrough and financial capital and he holds a PhD in quantum physics from Heidelberg University. Now let's start. Hi Jan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Rahul. Yeah, so I I I read about a, a Richard Feynman quote, you know, nobody understands quantum mechanic quantum mechanics. I mean, tell me about it. I it's not really easy to understand. It's true, it's quite counterintuitive at times, especially if you're used to let's say classical physics, you know, from from our macroscopic world. But yeah. once you dive deeper into the mic- microscopic effects of it, it can be quite confusing at first. Yeah, I think it has to do with the probability thing, right? Think nothing is certain; everything is just a probability. Everything is. I mean, the confusion starts there. Absolutely, it's something that also I think the human brain isn't very good at uh, grasping. You know, non yeah. non deterministic outcomes and probabilities. You see this in the in the stock market when people try to. you know sort of yeah extrapolate where where the stocks are going and it's super hard for an individual to do and so all of these kind of biases that people have kind of translate into making it very very unintuitive to understand quantum mechanics but i mean it is like formally very very well described and very well understood experimentally very well understood so it's very correct it just needs some time to to get to get used to it in a way yeah yeah so what is quantum computing Well, I would say in a way quantum computing is sort of the natural extension of classical computing. So with classical computing you have your bits, right? Your ones and zeros where you store information in and then you have your algorithms that that you know manipulate your information, your your ones and zeros to yeah. to to output a result. And all of this happens sort of on, you know, transistors on 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 silicon typically. Yeah. That that was the evolution of it. And in quantum you have quantum bits right the the so-called qubits which qubits. are not just ones and zeros but are basically they can be a superposition of both you know they can be both at the same time this is where it already gets a bit confusing but that's yeah. just how it is if we accept that for a moment and i think the the best visualization for this kind of state is sort of this this sphere right so you have a sphere where you have different states for example one can be at the top let's say of the sphere the north pole and and zero can be at the bottom and so you can have pretty much everything in between so that's kind of how you would you know visualize a a qubit and and these things are very powerful because they can store much 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 more information than than a classical bit right but it's just an extension of that of that concept really and in the end it's like again feynman said you know nature is is quantum mechanical so so the actual reality is quantum mechanical So it makes a lot of sense to use a quantum mechanical computer if you want to to simulate or to calculate something like proteins or like like biological matter and so on. So again, that's that's why I think of it sort of as a natural extension to to the classical computing and in terms of of operations, so sort of the algorithms that you have the functions and the loops that you have in classical computing, now they become quantum gates. right so you have operations that you apply to those qubits and you need to sort of manipulate them you know by shining lasers on them or or a microwave or whatever so there's different aspects of of manipulating those qubits in order to make them do something right to simulate yeah. your your drugs to simulate your your financial transactions whatever you want to apply this to and then the the last part is really this the sort of the infrastructure because it's not just silicon but there's like five or six competing possible hardware architectures you know be it trapped iron semiconductor uh, superconductors neutral atoms photonic systems so and this is where it becomes interesting because that's totally i'd say undecided for now you know what are the sort of the winning platforms i strongly believe there's going to be several of them so there's not going to be a strong consolidation to only one but maybe yeah. four who knows right this is still active research at the moment Yeah, so I'd love to know, uh, understand this a bit more deeply. So, in terms of a classical computer, 
you have this input that goes and then you get a single output right and and usually the calculation or storage of data it's usually in bits which is two states and with quantum bits it's three states essentially right the zero one and the superposition no it's basically yeah. it's one state and that one state can could have be. all of this information so it could be that the state is purely prepared as one or as zero or as again like if you think of it as an arrow on on that sphere on the on that globe it can point in pretty much any direction on that on that ball so so that's kind of the one state that you have that you put into your system and and really the difference between classical and quantum here is classical you have a very deterministic outcome so you put something in you get something out and if that sort of way is 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 defined um you always get out the same thing because it's deterministic, right? And so if you want to like probe something, you want to simulate, for example, something with different parameters, you have to change the input parameters and then run the calculation. on it. In quantum, it's different. You prepare your system such that it's very close to, to the environment you want to, to simulate. And then you just, and that's the beauty of it. You only need to run it once because all of the different scenarios, the different parameter settings are kind of embedded in that one calculation, right? And it gives you the result. The only thing is, and that is again something to understand, is that the result is not deterministic, it's probabilistic. So if you run the same thing with the same starting conditions, you might get a little bit of a different outcome. So you need to run it a couple of times to just get some statistics on, you know, what's the average outcome what is the spread of it and you know but that's still much more efficient than the classical approach which is just running it millions and millions of times yeah so you're essentially putting all the input variables at one go and then you're expecting this to come up with a number of probable output right exactly yeah. uh, <laughs> this is where i lose it you know how does this happen well i mean the the state itself that's that's quantum mechanics, right? You have Schrodinger's equation, yeah. you have a formalism that explains how these states change. And the challenge is to sort of map the states and the system. So the, the, the whole gate uh, sequence to construct it such that it mimics what you want to simulate in, in, in nature. Say, if you want to do drug discovery because you want to, to, to to find a new protein, for example, or, or then you kind of you need to have sort of a, a quantum twin of of your system of, of reality of, of a, a body, a human body that reacts, you know, some organs that react with that protein. And so when you bring those two together, they interact. And so all of that you need to sort of, you know, map onto your quantum system. You need to simulate in your and describe in your quantum system. And once you have that, you can play around with, with some of the parameters and, and be like, okay, what if I change the molecular structure a little bit? And, and then you don't have to do this in the lab anymore. So that's where you can have like, you know, drug discovery times cut by half or less and, 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 and costs cut by, by a factor of 10 or so. Yeah, yeah. And you also mentioned that I like, like unless in the case of classical uh, computers where which is silicon based, there are like multiple approaches for quantum mechanics. Uh, what are like some of the more popular ones? I would say the most popular one that that also gets the most attention is the superconducting one that that IBM and Google are are developing, just because it's also closer to to, to silicon in a way. So so the way like this is CMOS architecture. So so the way that that these things are are developed are sort of more, let's say, a bit more incremental or closer to, to, to the classical computing infrastructure. But there's like completely different systems, for example, trapped ions, right? Uh, or even neutral atoms that you trap with laser light and then every atom is one qubit. And so you can change the state of it and address each one individually, but they also interact with each other. So this another important aspect of those quantum systems is that the, the qubits, and you want to have quite many of them in order to, to have a complex, to be able to simulate a complex system is that they should be able to interact with each other. And then you get things like superposition and entanglement of the different qubits. So they, they're not separate, right? But they very much interact with each other like nature does as well. So 
having a long range interaction across, you know, let's say IBM published 400 and it produced 433 uh, qubits out of which not all are like, let's say useful and they're not all fully entangled, right? Um, but that's kind of the benchmark. I think they want to bring out uh, a chip with a thousand qubits this year and other systems have have maybe downsides in, in terms of coherence and how long you can run the systems and so on. But atomic systems you can build today with a thousand qubits and they have long range interaction. So all of these different systems have, have, have advantages and disadvantages. And I also believe that, that they will have different application areas, for example. So there are some systems, for example, the superconducting ones, so superconducting means it has to be cryogenically cooled, right? A really, really low temperature, which is quite a lot of energy. You don't put this in your house, right? It's like, it's like this basement type of super sealed and, and, and high maintenance device that you can use then for something like cloud computing. So someone else can have access via, via the internet, the classical means. But there's also other systems that potentially can run at room temperature. And so just looking way, way forward, you can think about a, a sort of a personal quantum computer or even like a business one in a smaller setting that you just have somewhere in, in a room. So And that becomes much more feasible then. And so that's how I can see different architectures really coexisting for a very long time. Yeah. So, so I was reading about this, I think a McKinsey robot, they mentioned that, you know, maybe we only need like four or 5,000 of quantum computers or something for everyone. <laughs> I was like reminded of what exactly we said, talk, said about classical computers, right? We said that, you know, the world needs only a like few computers <laughs> and now we have every, everyone has one. Yeah. There's also one interesting tweet that I saw from Robert Blackwell. Yeah, he's a partner at Y Combinator. So he, he was talking about, you know, lack of the, the lack of coherence. It happens, especially with the quantum computers when the temperature increases. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's also a talk about noise, but then he asked a question whether gravity has a role, a role to play in this. Like in the sense, like if it's zero G, would there be like a, a better coherence? Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I wouldn't rule it out. I think the, the effects of gravity are, are rather negligible. And certainly the effort of putting such a system in space only for the benefit of having micro gravity or zero gravity is is not worth sort of the the effort right and the cost so it's hard enough to to build it on earth so we're far away from from launching quantum computers in in space and i don't see like the immediate the immediate benefit the the biggest bottlenecks right now are the fidelities of of the single qubit and two qubit gates so the operations you 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 perform on like two qubits you know in order to entangle them for example to to create like interesting and useful states that fidelity is still not where it needs to be so it's something like you know 0.99 something eight or so when I mean, you need to go to like three or four nines right so 0 0.99 so basically 99.99 percent accuracy that when you do something you don't break up the system and that's kind of we take for granted in the in the classical world there's still yeah. Uh, a fidelity it's only so almost perfect that we don't care about it if it's only 99.98 percent or so that effect compounds and you need to have like thousands or millions of gate operations and then at the end you get like a very messy state that you can't really use anymore so so that's what we need to do now is to get better you know addressability of the qubits better hardware control and so on and i don't think gravity is a limiting factor but more like isolating the the systems from from outside radiation from vibrations and so on that's maybe a, a much bigger effect the vibrations you get from like a tram going past your lab and so on yeah so besides the temperature i also read about noise so i, I was curious you know, what noise is this a sound or <laughs> something else no, it's a thermal noise. I mean, if, if you're never at absolute zero and, and in the ground state, so you always have some excitations of, of the system. And if, for example, because you have to imagine like the, 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 the chip is like cooled to what, 0.1 uh, millikelvin or so. It's like really, really uh, cold. 
but it's connected to the outside world, right? So in every stage, you, you need to sort of cool the system a little bit because at some point you will have a classical connector that you plug in at room temperature. And so you have different stages of, of cooling, basically. That's why these systems that you typically see on, on you know, cover of Time magazine, or so, they're like these chandelier saying this, this inverted wedding cake structure because only the, the bit at the bottom is like super cool and the rest is like not so cool. And at some point it goes to, to room temperature. And, and at every point you, you can have like, you know, currents flowing somewhere, just increasing like inefficiencies that increase the, the temperature only a little bit. And, and your superposition breaks down, for example. So that, that's the kind of noise we're talking about. Yeah. And now let's, let's talk a little bit about the history, right? And where we are right now with quantum computing. I mean, I, I just read today that Richard Feynman was the one who actually coined the term quantum computing. Would lo- love to know a little bit more about the history and the progress that we've made so far. Right, right. I mean, the, the, the history of, of, of quantum mechanics is actually quite quite old yeah but the history of quantum computing as well i mean it was 1982 or so, so 1980s when 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 Feynman sort of had this idea that you know nature is quantum mechanical so and and classical computers were were already like co- conceivable and, and 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 even used in in some settings that you know there should be something like a quantum computer so the concept of it was developed in in, in the 80s right and, and for good reason, again, because it kind of makes sense that a natural system should be simulated or computed by, by a quantum computer. But then it, then it took a long time. And, and what we're talking about today, typically when we talk about quantum computers and even things like quantum communication and sensing is that that's sort of the second quantum revolution, right? But there was a first quantum revolution when quantum mechanics could be made very useful in the 60s, 70s with the advent of lasers, for example, and then Let's, you know, fast forward to the 90s. Everybody had like a disc man or like a CD player and DVD. That's all quantum effects, right? That, that you need to understand and, and, and commercialize, like make usable for, for a large scale application. And, and that's already, and there we take quantum for granted, but we, we shouldn't. That's already quite, <laughs> quite magical, you know, that you can have like a pocket, like a laser pointer and all that stuff. So that's already quantum in a way. Or MRIs, for example, in medicine was 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 used uh, already, you know, to 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 measure the nuclear spin of, of fabric and then get an image out of that. So that's all also quantum, right? So so quantum has been with us in in an industrial and in a commercial way for for a long time, for decades now. It's only now that with the second quantum revolution we get into a state or a stage where we can actually manipulate these systems. Like I was talking about single atoms being a qubit and then you can shine laser. It's like we have very, very like unprecedented control over these systems. And that's kind of a step function. That's why people call it the, the second quantum revolution. Yeah. And, and this happened in 2019. Uh, usually that, that's the moment that people keep talking about, right? The breakthrough where it solved like a mathematical problem that would have taken a classic computer 10,000 years or something in 200 seconds. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people want to sort of pinpoint it to to a date, but I always have trouble with that. I don't think it's it's ever you know a single incident, and even that that Google publication of of quantum advantage has been disputed. And like, we're not even there yet to to say like once you've proven quantum advantage over a classical computer that you can do it faster, better, cheaper. Or you do something that a classical computer could never do. That's sort of the ultimate goal. But you need to do that like 10 times, 100 times, a couple of times to be comfortable that, okay, you've not just once, right? And say, oh, that's the magical point. So once we have that, you can go back and see, okay, what were the sort of the milestones? What was the biggest, maybe the biggest, really biggest milestone is still yet to come. We just don't know yet. And so going back, I would say, even in the 2000s and and, and 210s, there, there were like, you know, gradual improvements, incremental improvements that, that all sort of played a role in, in, in getting us to where we are today, right? So we're all standing on the shoulder of giants. It's not just that, okay, one time Google turned it up and, 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 and that was the magical moment, but it was a breakthrough, you know, uh, moment and, and it is kind of very important, but not the single one and not, not, not the only one. Yeah. I think they built on top of the research of two 
to research physicist who were like working at IBM and they had actually theoretically proven this in 2004 or something i mean again i would say even even today and in a couple of weeks ago there was another claim and so on it's it's not yeah it 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 it's still not undisputable right you need to get to a level where there's just no way that people are are, are doubting it and at, at this point because it's also a commercial thing right it's it's a bit yeah. like ibm versus google and they're like okay who you know it's a bit of marketing you know claiming something that you you achieve because they've also i mean and to be fair, I mean, they're the ones that put a lot of money into into the development. So they also want to, you know, reap something in, in the meantime. Uh, so I get it. But scientifically, we should just be a bit like cautious and, and observe and, and see. And, and at some point, this will for sure come up as a milestone in, in the quantum computing history. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that it's sort of the emergence or, or the advent of, of anything. Yeah. So what are the use potential use cases, commercial use cases that is? Oh, there's so many because it's really, I mean, if you think about it, it's a platform. Yeah. It's an architecture, Software. right? It's not just one single thing, but it's just, it's just computing. And so what are the use yeah. cases of classical computers? <laughs> everything. <laughs> so recording think... podcast here, right? It's everything, yeah. right? That's, that's yeah. the point. But Let's say most naturally, again, and, and like starting from, from a logical point, is that quantum computers can be used to simulate quantum systems, like natural systems, like drug discovery or protein folding. and all that. Like life sciences is certainly a, a field where cancer treatment and so on is like finding new vaccines and all of that is, is you can simulate if you have your quantum twin of, of the world that will have a huge impact that, that classical computers cannot, cannot do today. And to me, this is sort of the most, again, most natural, most, most intuitive area. But there's other areas like logistics, for example, which are purely, I would say, d d digital in a way. I mean, it's just it's a mathematical problem. You know, the, the, the traveling salesman that has like 20 cities and he knows how far they are apart, but he doesn't know what's the shortest route so I can visit all of them and get back to where I started from. And, yeah. and this problem is like super hard. It's like NP hard <laughs> challenge to, to tackle. And it's very, very difficult for quantum, uh, for, for classical computers, but quantum computers can do this very well. I like if, you know, the infrastructure works, uh, but in theory they can do this very well. And, and so you will have that sort of, you know, improving train schedules and, and, and traffic control in the cities and all of that things. And also in the financial industries, yeah? you can do pricing, option pricing, for example, you can do faster and, and, and more efficient, more accurate, more accurate and, and it's just, it, it costs you less to do it once the systems are stable enough. Because again, all of the, the different parameters, because there's so many dependencies in, in pricing and option, all of them are kind of, you know, embedded into the system and then you run it. Whereas classically, you need to make sure that you don't, you know, forget any any dependencies on, on the outside world. So that's where quantum computers really, really excel. So also in the financial services industry, huge, huge potential. Yeah. And in terms of uh, quantum, quantum computing's like ability to disrupt the existing status quo, I think one area is cryptography, right? So uh, these computers could easily make the existing cryptography cryptography standards like not viable anymore absolutely absolutely i mean if you look at, at the rsa encryption today um basically everything which is encrypted today you will be able to to crack with Easily. a powerful enough quantum computer right so so this is why people are working on on two things one is quantum key distribution so cryptography on a quantum level where it's like mathematically proven that it's that it's absolutely secure yeah as i was saying yeah why by measuring it you you, you change the, the the state and so you know basically that someone eavesdropped and the other path is of course like post-quantum cryptography which actually isn't quantum at all but it's just finding the next algorithm classical algorithm like the successor to rsa that enables you to to encrypt your data today such that it is at least for a while it's sort of 
unbreakable by a quantum computer until the quantum computer gets so powerful that it can break even that. So that's kind of a race, right? That's always yeah. going to be a race. And there's always going to be the need for the next sort of generation of, of encryption algorithms. Yeah. Whereas something like, like using the quantum nature to encrypt the information, there's no, I mean, to our understanding of the world <laughs> and quantum mechanics, there is no possible way to, to encrypt, to decrypt that or to, to break that ever. So you, you don't get more secure than that, right? And, and that's obviously important for defense use cases, governmental information, so really highly classified information. But it can become sort of, yeah, an area that, that also telecoms and enterprises go into and, and they want to have their data really secure, like strategy or, or just important company data. And in terms of like factors limiting the space uh, in terms of commercialization, what are those? Do we have enough talent? Uh, is the tech uh, the, the, the limiting factor here? And yeah, I think we should also speak about, you know, the whole product, productivity paradox, right? The, the cost of adopting this is going to actually increase the cost. So it's going to make it less productive. That makes it less likely for a lot of use cases or a lot of these companies to adopt this, right? So, right. I mean, it's, but that's always the case with, with the new, especially with such a disruptive technology. So in the beginning, not, not, I mean, still not many people, I mean, really make money, you know, net, net profit. So there's still a lot of investments going in. There's some benefit coming out already. I think the biggest benefit, at least for enterprises is to, to start taking it seriously and, and digging into it, because if you wait another five years, then it's too late, right? Then because late, yeah. if you wait until it's like, you know, a commodity and, and it's foolproof and it just works and then start to really think about, you know, how can I use this for my business? What does it mean for me? How do I even, yeah, program a quantum computer? Like programming it is really, really different from, from, just working, you know, in computer science with, with Python and, and, and so on. So nowadays, and it's coming back to talent, is, is basically you need someone who is a good programmer and a quantum physicist at the same time. So you kind of need to have both. And this is going to become simpler, you know, as, as pro quantum programming languages become more and more even abstract, but just more, more, more user-friendly, let's say. But still, at this point, if you really want to, and how do you know if, if you really mapped your quantum system to, 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 to a real world problem or not, you need to understand both, right? And understand how to do that. This is very difficult for now. And, and I think, so talent is certainly a, a limiting factor where I would say even, I mean, Europe is, is far ahead, at least the European Union, in terms of graduates that have sort of a quantum related background even like way ahead of the US. And I think that's at least for, for Europe, it's, it's kind of a, a big plus point. Yeah. There's some other downsides that we can talk about in terms of funding, but in terms of talent, I think that's, that's a clear USP. Apparently the University of New South Wales, they started a grad program dedicated for <laughs> quantum computing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, like you mentioned, I mean, if, if you wait, long like for five more years then you're already too late so what is the way forward for all these companies who are trying so it's not just solving a product issue right it's also like you have to create that market like there are not many customers at the moment and how do you convince so what is the way forward right now for, for a lot of these startups yeah i mean one way forward is is for sure and that's going to be important for 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 some time is is to do so-called quantum hybrid approaches where you still have a classical component, but you're basically using a quantum computer and that you can do already today to take care of very limited aspects of a certain bigger problem, right? So the, the classical quant the, the classical algorithm sort of takes care of the structure, you know, what happens, what are the, the loops and the functions and so on. And then certain bits are sort of taken over by the quantum computer. Then that limited calculation is performed, result comes back, and then the classical computer takes over and does something with it. Obviously not in a long term, the dream case and, and where you can leverage all of the 
benefits of quantum systems. But one, I mean, you can do something with it today, again, just, you know, to, to use it. And two, it, it forces you more and more and gradually more to think how, what role does a quantum computer play? And it's going to play a bigger and bigger role. So you're going to like implement more and more classical procedures into the quantum uh, part, right? And, and that, because otherwise you're just waiting, right? For, for some magic to happen in the, in the hardware space where it's like, okay, here's a quantum system with a thousand qubits. They're all fault tolerant. You can just use it. And then, okay, what do I do with it now? It's much better to to go step by step and sort of learn this journey as 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 the industry is evolving, the tech is evolving. Also, learn how to use it, which makes much more sense. And so, we see a lot of companies investing already uh, significant budgets today in in that. Yeah, and uh, does it also make sense to you know try to solve specific problems, maybe like weather or something like that? You know, predicting weather, something like you said, close. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really depends on, on, I would urge every enterprise to, to look at this, you know, and think about, okay, what can I take out of this? And then that really depends very much on the, on the, um, on the, on the industry, but, but just thinking, you know, what, what is the benefit of, of quantum computing for, for my, for my personal business, and then have at least, you know, some like a team or so dedicated to, to just exploring this, like, you know, companies are doing with AI, obviously, and that, that's the right thing to do. It's a different time scale, of course, yeah, but but still quantum should should not be, you know, left for, for the others because you have basically like three, you know, se- segments. One are like the IBMs and Googles that are really pushing it forward and, you know, investing yeah. a lot in, in trying to build this up. Then there's like the ones that are really taking it seriously and, and as I said, you know, actively exploring the use cases and, and just trying stuff out and spending some time and money on it to do it now. And then there's like a third class, which exists, obviously, which saying, you know, it's not for us and it's not interesting. Maybe it'll never come and all of that. So we'll just wait and see. And then when it's like a commodity, we'll might just, you know, purchase it and t- have someone else tell us how to use it because then we don't, we still don't know yeah. what to do with it. Yeah, then you're not going to make much money. But <laughs> yes, so uh, you also mentioned the hybrid approach, right? So uh, how is the interaction between classical computers and uh, the quantum computers? Is it like a software layer or? Well, both. I mean, yes, it's it's mostly a software layer. Of course, you have you have a hardware component as well. But but you, as I said before, you always have that connection from the quantum system, which, you know, be it superconducting and, and, and very cool and the topology of it that somehow you have a readout and the readout at some point is going to be turned into classical digital information that is laid on our monitors and so on. So you always have an intersection somewhere, right? The question is, where is it? And in the hybrid approach, it's just narrow. So the the quantum part is just smaller and there's more classical around it. Whereas in, in the fully quantum scenario, basically, quantum plays the biggest role and the rest is sort of, you know, you have a keyboard that you use to type <laughs> your your commands into, and then you have an output that basically shows you your database and your files and your graphs and so on. So that that part will always remain classical. And also to be to be maybe super transparent, I mean, I don't think that at any point quantum computers will completely exchange, you know, or make co- classical computers obsolete. It's like if you think of a of a, of a cloud stack, you know, and you have to like CPUs. You have GPUs, the graphical processing units, and then you will have QPUs, which is the quantum processing unit. And depending on your problem, you know, maybe even the algorithm is, is clever enough to, to pick or at least to suggest to you how much, you know, GPU capabilities do you need, how much QPU, for example. But it's never that, you know, we will never have laptops again or like classical computers. Why should we not have that for very simple things that are just not, not at all quantum? Yeah. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, I read about this school of thought where, you know, people argue that the human agency might influence the outcomes, meaning the, 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 the person operating the computer, the quantum computer might need to be considered as part of the system because it has an, so it has a big influence on the, the output. 
so i didn't fully understand this so, so the, then the argument uh, is that you know we need to have standards there as well so otherwise you would not have that certainty yeah i mean standards will will arise for sure i mean there's in a way there's some standards already being put in place by by just shaping how like quantum programming languages are are built up right like hiskit for example and and i mean it's very in a way it's sort of close to python and and that kind of helps you know sort of the the transition and and the logical thinking but there's many aspects that are just plain new and and for example you need to know much more about you know linear algebra and so on and matrix multiplication and and so it's a different kind of of thinking and and the people that are thinking about it and using it a lot they will obviously influence where where it is going and, and the development also of the software part of it and the programming languages so so that's kind of an effect in the end of course we need to get to a state where it doesn't really matter like if if for example if you have a, a website right of course like the design will be different whether you or i make it but overall the like the security has, should have a basic you know requirements or or should just the, the the what it is used for and how it how you interact with the website should be fairly standardized no matter whether you do it or i do it so so at that point we've already come to a conclusion that you know that's how it is or if you upload an app to the app store there's sort of certain requirements just to make it a bit more homogeneous and to make it a bit more expectable where do i expect the button or what you know how do things work in the quantum world this is still like super open because no one has and there's not one person that's going to decide it but it's rather it's just going to converge and so the people working on it um will have a big influence in setting some of those de facto standards even if it's not you know not regulation or anything it's just things that just grow into into being and at some point they're just okay this is how we're going to do things now yeah 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 and now from a vc point of view is this emerging tech really vc fundable in the sense i mean like you already you already spoke about the existing existing incumbents like big companies uh, big tech companies like ibm and uh, google spending mm -hmm. a lot of resources and there are also my understanding is that there's also startups uh, who are well funded uh, and who already has uh, like a lot of platforms already in place so then is there opportunity for new startups to come in uh, if yes where are those opportunities so let's say i mean there's hundreds of of startups in in the quantum space globally and and for good reason because there's a lot of opportunity also besides you know the the incumbents and, and the classical the, the big players the the fields i would say of quantum computing especially on the hardware side is sort of closing up because there's already quite a few big ones well funded in the us you know public companies and so on like inq rigetti and and some others so that becomes more and more difficult to come up with a completely new hardware architecture and and you know just start now that kind of seems a bit a bit late but up until recently a couple of let's say years or even months ago there were still opportunities so it's not you know it's not ruled out that there's still opportunities i think the bigger opportunities are for sure in the communication and sensing part especially early stage if you want to invest in an early stage you know seed series a company today your better bet would be to go with one of the communication or sensing startups at the same time reality is that you know the quantum computing part of let's say the overall quantum technologies ecosystem is also where most of the money lies right and and most of the funding so it's so it's disproportionate by a factor of 10 or so how much money goes into quantum computing so as a vc is always the question you know what's what's the journey so so there's going to be growth funding required at some point where does that money come from i mean there's huge governmental programs as well there's tens of billions of of dollars worldwide allocated and committed by by governments for for these kind of programs for for these yeah, for quantum technologies so that's one one sort of funding source you know just governmental contracts like the dlr for example in germany is 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 handing out and so 
that makes a lot of sense. But just know that, yeah, if you start today with a quantum startup in, in let's say, communication, sensing, and so on, you have to think really big, like about the, the, the size of the market, yeah, and, and where this can be going. Because the exits, let's say, might not be as 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 large as a startup that really builds up an entirely new hardware architecture. Yeah. And has there been any exits? So uh, I think I've read about uh, Iron Cube, uh, which went public via SPAC, but then it, it didn't do well. So has there been any exit? It's still a bit early, I would say. So for sure, Iron Cube is, is a very prominent example. And I have to subtract sort of the 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 macro perspective and the whole like maybe you know having done a SPAC wasn't like at the time it was a bit you know a bit more trendy uh maybe not the best decision it's hard to say you know what the alternative would have been at least with that path they could they could secure some funding but it doesn't mean that the underlying tech or or what they're developing isn't good so so it's, they, yeah. they're still making good progress so I, I certainly not write them off for sure but it's not, it's not, the time hasn't come yet for, for the sort of the bigger consolidation or like larger companies buying off, you know, quantum startups and so on, just because it's all still very early. So, and if, if you compare that to a so sort of classical VC 10 year fund life cycle, that is of course a challenge, right? That is a challenge because you, you do something, you know, exit. Yeah, you need an exit, but you also want to to fund something and then create a company which is like disruptive. And and in, yeah. in that area, uh, because we're not talking about e-scooters, we're not talking about you know ten minute toothpaste delivery. This kind of innovation takes much much longer than than let's say a business model innovation or so. So things take time. There's still ways for every VC at every stage. If you're super early, like pre-seed, seed, for example then you can do secondary. So you don't even need to IPO or sell the company. You can just take some money out, give it back to your LPs. And then maybe you find a way to, I don't know, with the follow on fund or so to still, you know, re retain a share in that startup. If you really believe in it and you just want to stick with it for, for longer than 10 years, let's say there, there's, there's possibilities to do that. But, but yeah, it's something to, to keep in mind. Yeah. The, yeah. And some deep tech funds, they have 12 or 15 year fund. So that also probably makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that, that helps a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And like, okay, in terms of assessing like a quantum computing startup, right? What, what is the process like? I think, so I think we've reached sort of a, a technical understanding well enough for that not to be the bottleneck. I mean, if we look at a startup, we look at the technology and then we can understand whether it's like, let's say, you know, legit or not. So, so we can see that. And, and most of them really are because they come from, you know, scientific backgrounds. So we see very little, I wouldn't say none, but very little uh, cases where people just make something up, let's say, or it's like super exaggerated. Typically, it's what they claim also, also makes sense and it's technologically feasible. So then the differentiator really becomes the business side. So are you able to generate traction in whatever way, like interest, time, money, for sure, like POCs and so with, with customers, right? So can you get someone else than just us as a VC interested and engaged into what you're doing? That, that's probably the most vital, you know, differentiator when we look at different deals and, and some are just very early and they tell us, you know, oh no, because we're still developing and, and others are a bit further ahead and just wants to, to co-develop together with their customers or like development partners and so on. And, and this is of course a much better sign. Yeah. And you know, uh, people talk about science risk and engineering risk when it comes to assessing things like this. Uh, uh, could, could you explain? I, I, I really hear, uh, want to understand the difference between uh, an, a science risk and an engineering risk, especially in the context of uh, quantum computing. Absolutely. So the, the, the question is really about the, the maturity of, of, of the technology. So at some point, you're... It's, and, and you start with the science risk, which is, is it at all scientifically 
possible? Like, is it is it feasible that that you get certain effects to 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 run? That that's sort of the the very early stage, and that kind of transforms into the engineering challenge, let's say, where you need, for example, to do this on a large scale. So you can mitigate the scientific risk by showing that it worked once or five times, but then you have the engineering challenge to to come scale. up with a process to scale it, to, to build a thousand, 10,000 of it, depending on what it is. Like if it's a whole quantum computer, if you build 50 or so respect, you know, that's already, that's already engineering. If it's like a quantum repeater, for example, that you need to enhance and, and amplify your signal every 50 to 100 kilometers, and you want to do this large, then you need a lot of them. So then we're talking about, okay, you need to build like 10,000 or 100,000 or 50,000 to, to show that, okay, this really scales. So what I've done in a small package, I can now do on a large scale. That's kind of the, the engineering challenge. And, and thus, wherever there's a challenge, there's a risk that it doesn't work. So, and with quantum, yeah, a lot of it is, is, is still in the scientific area. So, so just, again, build one, build one quantum computer, and then we'll think about scaling it. But you do have to think about it from the beginning. Like you can't just blindly build one and then turn the knob and be like, okay, now I'm scaling. But rather while you're building the first one, you think about every component. Okay, how is this going to look like in five years, in 10 years? Is this something, should I use this component or that? Or oh, this one scales better, so I'm going to use that because I know where I want to go later. Yeah. And, you know, I, I heard another VC talk about this. Uh, usually the founders operating in the space are from scientific background. And like you said, you know, then the, uh, scientists usually operate with a mindset of doubt. But if you're a business person, you have to operate with the mindset of conviction. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like an opposing <laughs> kind of uh, thought, uh, which makes it a bit challenging. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. But, but when you look at purely business driven teams in maybe some of the not so technical areas, then then you have the, the other risk. Uh, on the other hand, that it's like overly optimistic, right? Yeah, and, and you get yeah, like yeah. startups and, and companies built around business cases that just don't work or only work in a very low interest rate environment. And so should that exist, right? Or is some form of caution, caution makes sense to, to have it and, and, and to have a deep thought about which, which way to go and what is commercializable and what not. So, but yeah, for sure, the best teams we see and, and, and we invest in, you know, have both these, these aspects and are, are good at business as well. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a hard time for all kinds of startups. How hard is it for quantum computing startups in terms of fundraising? Right. I mean, it really depends on, so, I mean, there's obviously like the stage aspect of it, like the earlier stage you are, the less harder relatively speaking it is right so we still see a lot of pre-seed seed even series a funding rounds sure at different conditions than two years ago but then also two years ago was like an anomaly so there's still activity and also if you compare it to because it's deep tech and you compare it to you know some let's say shallow tech startups that are having a much harder time like if you're a fintech right now or so it's it's even harder to to do so in that case it's relatively good compared to other possible scenarios but overall like looking at over time of course it's a bit more challenging right now we, we see a little bit of of relaxation now you know hoping that next year could be you know picking up momentum and and just having more activities so a number of startups founded in that area is, is is decreasing a bit but that always comes and goes a bit in in waves so so i wouldn't put too much emphasis on that we're really just there you know looking for for exceptional teams that that, that are building something in that in that space because in the end we don't need to invest in 20 of them right we invest in two or three and that's kind of our portfolio structure yeah and in terms of progress right so let's say a startup is at series b funding stage uh, in quantum computing Will those startups already have a customer or like, you know, what would be the progress that they've made? Yeah, for sure. I mean, 
the 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 expectations on on revenue levels and so on are obviously quite different from from a typical SaaS business, right? Again, because of the maturity of the entire industry, so it's not to blame the startup that they haven't, you know, gotten to 100 million ARR, but you should definitely at that point have proven that that you have again something worth you know spending time and money on and so i mean for sure if if if, if you're going towards series b you'd have some double digit millions of, of, of revenue in, in in some sort you know typically it's like project base it's not yet fully recurring because again companies don't know yet where this is going and they're not planning super far ahead but like more on a year by year basis which is fine for now but at least you know they see the value maybe they have again like repeating customers and and, and follow on projects and so on so you can look at all kinds of different metrics that 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 show that you know there's real business value and, and interest from from customers there yeah and uh, why are you uh, so interested in quantum computing as an emerging tech person well i mean I am a quantum physicist myself, so so I did my my PhD in quantum physics at Heidelberg University, at a time where it just wasn't, at least for me back then, really feasible to 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 spin out anything or commercialize anything of 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 that. But I've always kept sort of this this love and and fascination and interest in in quantum physics for sure, following it over the years and. And so it's it's kind of natural for me to to be in that in that space and and combining it with with a business perspective, you know, to see how you can create value beyond sort of the scientific achievements. That that for me is sort of the, the perfect intersection of you know technological breakthroughs and and financial capital. So uh, let's summarize this, right? If I were to ask you, what would be your advice uh, for somebody who's interested in study quantum computing on a founder who wants to build some a startup in quantum computing or like a VC who wants to fund <laughs> quantum computing startups and businesses who may or may not be interested. What would be your advice be for all these people? Yeah. So I would say for students, uh, I would really urge them to, to look deeply into the field, you know, and, and, and research, you know, quantum computing languages, programming languages, maybe even take a course at, at a university. I mean, there's entire quantum degrees or, or, or very quantum heavy and quantum focused degrees at, at, a, at a bunch of universities, hundreds of universities worldwide that offer that. So if you're thinking about a career path, you know, next to data science and, and say classical IT, I think quantum and quantum information is like very important. It's going to be super important in the future. So worth, you know, brushing up skills and, and getting also even like a degree in that in that area. Very future proof for founders. As we discussed before, I think the biggest opportunity nowadays and for some time will, will be in quantum Sense. communication and quantum sensing. Sense. So you can use sort of your, your tech expertise in, in those areas and to, to start a company and there's funding for that. Um, likewise for VCs, right? If, if they're new sort of to, to the topic, look into those areas and also try to find a strong consortium with, with a quantum expert. So... I'm very much for strong syndicates where one party, you know, can bring the, the quantum expertise and others that don't have to be, you know, fully made out of, of quantum physicists and their team in order to be able to invest in quantum computing. So that way we can just leverage more, more capital for this, for this cause, for this important um, breakthrough. And lastly, for the enterprises, it's really about getting into it right now and not waiting five years and, and be a laggard. So, so you want to be spending time and a certain amount of, of budget and maybe allocate a small team for the topic of quantum and then understanding what are the different quantum areas that, that benefit your business in the future and then start working on them today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.